Good morning, Blue Year Fellowship. We're so glad you came to praise the Lord with us today on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you if you're a father. If you would, stand to your feet and let's get going. friend 
secret in a quiet place in the stillness you are there in the secret in the quiet hour I wait only for you You may be seated. Amen. Well, amen. Amen. Let me uh, just say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in here. And, and church, I would ask that you join me. So I'm going to ask all the fathers if you would stand this morning. And so if you're a father, please stand. And then, uh, let's church, let's just celebrate. Give them a round of applause for all the fathers here. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I was uh, looking at a report recently, and it gave like the top 20 
uh, most celebrated holidays. And Christmas was one, Mother's Day was two. So that's right, you got Jesus, then your mama. And, but dad was like, tw- Father's Day was like 20. And I was like, well, that's, that's not fair. Um, but know that here you are celebrated, amen. You are celebrated. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers in here. We're gonna be in First Chronicles 11, 10 through 19. Uh, but before we do that, If you would, let's stand and let's just greet everybody that's here this morning. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you could return back to your seats and remain standing, if you will. Return to your seats and remain standing. If I can get Sophia, I think she's out there greeting people. But if I can get Sophia to come up, and she's going to do today's scripture reading. And again, we're going to be in 1 Chronicles 11, 19, 19, 11, 10 through 19. I think some people are trying to still make it back to their chairs, so I'll wait so we can read the Word of God together. Is that a subtle hint? (laughs) Good job. Okay. Today's scripture again is out of 1 Chronicles 11, 10 through 19. Now these are the heads of the mighty men whom David had, who gave him strong support in his kingdom together with all Israel, to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. These constitute the list of the mighty men whom David had. Jehoshabim? Jehoshabim. Okay. The son of a Heshaminite. I should have probably studied this first, the, the names. The chief of the 30, he lifted up his spear against 300 whom killed at one time, whom he killed at one time. After him was Ele- Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighty men. He was with David at Pasadena. When the Philistines were gathered together there to battle, and there was a plot of ground full of barley, and the sun fled before the Philistines. They took their stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great victory. Now three of the 30 chief men went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam, while the army of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me before my God that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? For at the risk of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father, and we just thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. And Father, it is right now, Father, I just lift up all the fathers that are here right now, Father, and I just pray a blessing over their lives, Father. Father, I pray that you continue to give them courage, Father, and conviction, Father, to to raise and to lead their families, Father. 
Father, I pray, Father, the world continues just to beat down on fathers, Father, but I pray that you just continue to raise us up, Father. Father, give us just boldness, Father, to continue to proclaim your name, Father. Father, and be the men that you've called us to be, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, please remain standing.
Amen and amen. You may be seated. So we said happy Father's Day, also happy Juneteenth. Some people don't understand what that holiday's about. It became a national holiday, a federal holiday in, I guess it was last year, in 2021. But uh, on January 1st, 1863, I believe, it was Abraham Lincoln uh, put into action the Emancipation Proclamation. Still in the midst of the Civil War, word didn't get down to many of the southern states, but I believe it was uh, on this date, a year and a half, two years later, the word came as the Union Army arrived in Galveston and announced. You know, I've always thought is that is a great spiritual illustration, too, in regard to those of us who are in Christ. Some still don't realize they've been set free in Christ, and they're still being held bondage. But happy day to everyone here today. Amen? Uh, I want to talk about being a, a man of valor. And although this is Father's Day and this message is pretty much geared to our, to our men in our congregation today, uh, this is a message that's really for all of us about being people of valor and being honorable people of integrity. We read from, uh, I don't know what happens when we get those passages of scriptures like that. I think some ladies say, I'm not reading that. And, <laughs> and then poor Sophia gets caught with it every time. But uh, applaud her, her bravery in reading some of those names. I had one of the ladies from the Magnolia campus come and says, Amen. Kevin said, you need to clarify a few things for me here, uh, especially on that Elhan and the son of Dodo. Is that Dodo or Dudu or what is it? So you, you covered it pretty well. I, you know, that was a strange name back then, obviously. Uh, I assume the name probably meant something different than it does today, being a Dodo or a Dudu or whatever. But nonetheless, it, it was Elhan and uh, his father was him. Amen. But uh, as it mentions this list of names, there's a whole lot more than what people realize to this list. And in First Corinthians chapter, uh, Chronicles, excuse me, chapter 11, if you want to open your Bible there, you can, because we're going to be referring back to that. Also in chapter 12, there's some other mentions of these people who were called David's mighty men or David's men of valor. Uh, in First Chronicles 11, it says in the first that we read, it says, then all of Israel gathered together. Let me find the uh, remote. There we go. It says, then all of Israel gathered together. And the Hebrews saying, Behold, we are thy bone and, and thy flesh. And moreover in times past, even when Saul was king, thou was the one that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. And it says, Therefore the, the elders came out, and basically they're all coming, as we read earlier, and they're anointing David to be king. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with this Old Testament process of David's life and ministry, remember, as a young man, he's already been anointed to be the king by, by Samuel. And, of course, because the king, Saul, the first king, was rebellious and was not a man of integrity. He was, he was iffy, double-minded, in and out, up and down, never could decide what he really wanted to do. And so God is moving all the time in his work and his ministry. Now, the people are there to anoint now in the presence, uh, officially, I, I guess so to say. Uh, this, this, again, is certainly a relationship to that Juneteenth story, you know, how that God's done something here and this has happened, yet we're just we're still catching up to things. Amen. And so it says hey, all the people are gathered for this, and David makes a covenant with Hebron, and he becomes the king over all the people of Israel. Now, uh, understand, as I talk about this, this story and these particular men, at this coronation, there are these men, which are these honorable men. Uh, mentions three, it says of the 30, there were these 30 men who were uniquely committed to David, even before the coronation, all right? They understood the promises of God. In fact, look at verse 10 in that passage, and I'll put it up. It says here, it says that uh, these men, these are also the chief of the mighty men whom David had. Catch this. They strengthened themselves with him and his kingdom and with Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Uh, they gave David strong support. They were there not only at this coronation. They were there in the tough times. They were there when there was no coronation. They were there because they knew David was truly the king of Israel, uh, according to God's word and to God's will. And they were there to defend and support and to be with him in this whole process. And now they're being recognized even at this coronation. Men of courage, men of valor, called David's mighty men. Now, about four years ago, maybe, Gary, maybe you can straighten me out on this. We did a men's retreat around these guys, all right? And uh, Gary took us uh, apart, and Tim took a part of this, and I took a part. And we did about six or seven messages on these men. Well, today, I'm, as Father's Day, I thought it would be just good to compile all those seven things into one message for us today. And I'm not going to take seven hours with it, all right? I promise. 
but I want us to really get a grip on what, what's going on here because I don't think that there's a, that there's a uh, I don't think that this is just historical. I think there's some application for us today, all right, because all the Word of God is, is suitable for teaching and for preaching. And just as much as David was ruling in his kingdom and being exalted as the king, we have another king named Jesus, and he is the king, and God's already anointed him Messiah and king. But yes, the world does not know about it yet. They haven't caught up to it yet. We know, and we should be like these men who were committed to David, even when Jesus' lordship has not been fully recognized. Now, it will be. The Bible says there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the king. He's the Lord, all right? That day is coming. Right now, there's resistance to that. And in the world, just as it was in David's world, there were those who resisted that, who wanted Saul, and Saul himself, who did not want David to be anywhere near the throne or leadership, and who was rejecting him. But these men, and it mentions these 30, and we're going to look at some of their names specifically, they had committed themselves to extending the kingdom of David when the rest of the world was rejected. Men reject our king. Men reject our king's kingdom. But still, if you're a Christian, you've been called to extend the kingdom of God. They weren't content to sit around and say, well, you know, God said it's going to happen, so I guess it'll happen. <laughs> no. They were busy being a part of the battles. They were fighting. They were sweating. They were bleeding. They were sacrificing. They were committing. In the midst of all this, they stepped up and they took action, they risked their lives, they sacrificed their convenience and said some things are more important. And I think that's where we have to come back to in our mindset and in our world today if we're going to see a revival, if we're going to see God do something in our nation and in our homes. Because the kingdom of God is not yet fully established, but it is alive and it is active, and we should be a part of those people who say, you know what, I want to be like those guys, a man, a woman of valor, a person of valor, a person of integrity, a person of strength. Th that's what I want to be. Now, when we shared this at our men's retreat, we brought out about four qualities of these guys, and each took a section on those qualities and those characteristics because there are some traits that, that really become obvious. Now, one thing it says about this, these were men who had great exploits. uses that word three times in verse 19, 22, and 24, exploits. And exploits are those things that are, that are heroic actions. They're, they're deeds and feats and adventures that are carried out in the name of the king and for the king. I really do believe that is what God has for every child of God today, exploits, things that we are doing for the glory of God, things that we are living out, places that we are going, things that we are saying, words that are being uttered to people who might not even want to hear about the king, but yet we're being, we're being faithful, we're being loyal, we're being committed, and in that category of people of valor, that's where we should all want to find ourselves. Now, we picked out when we did this, the thing, as I said with the men's retreat, several elements that, are, that, are just, that stand out about these men. And the first one I want to bring to you is this, this element of courage. You can't miss the, the, the courage that these guys had. And for men or women, whoever, uh, to do what God's called us to do, it's going to take this, this element of courage. If you're really going to be what God's called you to be, if you're going to be a part of it, having exploits as recognized as part of your life and your testimony, your ministry as exploits when you stand before God, and, and all of us will, all right? When we stand before God, there should be some exploits that are listed in our names that we were faithful people of God. And you see these guys, and, and mention some of them by name. I'll bring three that kind of recognize or we can recognize as part of these, these exploits. First one's mentioned is Jashabane. Verse 11, it says that he killed 300 men in one, or, one encounter by himself. That's a pretty good-sized exploit, all right? Now, we're not out killing people for Jesus, <laughs> all right? But we are, we are in a battle. We should be seeing a difference in people's lives around us because we are courageous. Now, all around us, uh, you, don't, you don't have to look very far if you really be honest with yourself. How many of you know people who are hurting today? I mean, you know their lives are just, they're, they're struggling. They may be dealing with some issue in their life. There may be some addiction in their life. Maybe their marriage is falling apart. But there's something going on that they need somebody to come alongside and help them out, all right, and speak a word to them. And that element 
uh, picking that phone up or seeing that person or going to that person, that all involves for the child of God a, a point of courage in their life. I'm going to be that person. Somebody's going to have to do it. You know, there's a sh sinking ship. We have the life rafts as Christians. And we're living in a world, we know where this is all going. We know that Jesus is coming back. We know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We know what the Bible says about end times and how difficult it's going to be. But God has, has birthed us into this time, this generation, this part in time in history. So we ought to be those who realize what's going on, what's happening around us, and say, hey, we have the answers. Let's speak up. Let's speak out. Let's, let's take courage and do what needs to be done. Let's make the phone call. Let's knock on the door. Let's make the visit. Let's help somebody. Amen? And that requires, whether you realize it or not, an element of courage. This guy, he, he certainly has courage here. Let me fix this mic. He certainly has courage here. He's, he's standing in a field. The battles are going on. And he steps up and just does something that's, that's pretty much, obviously, it took more than him. This is a miracle. God overshadows this guy. The presence of God is with him. And he's allowed in this particular battle for these 300 slain uh, rebellious Philistines who didn't want anything to do with God. He, he's not one of those guys, Joshua Beam's not one of those guys, you know, who's sitting down and says, uh, hey, uh, I, I'm just going to pray and read my Bible. We need to pray and read our Bible. But he's going to, hey, pray, read my Bible. And what does the Bible say? Oh, well, that's what I'm going to do. It's the next step. I mean, oh, oh God's, called me. God's called me to service. God's called me to ministry. Yeah, you, yeah, me, God's gift to me. Yeah, you, okay, let's go do it. Let's use what I've been given. But let me tell you this, Honestly. This life goes by like that. It's over. It's done. All right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a flash in the pan. Eternity's forever. And as Christians, if, the, if you're here and you're a believer today, you need to realize that what you are in eternity, what you do in eternity, what God has for you in eternity is pretty much dependent upon what you do now. No, no, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But the Bible says once we come to Christ, all right, and we know Jesus personally, that we've been called, you know, to fulfill God's will and purposes for our life. What if I'm not faithful? Am I going to experience those blessings every time? I'll be in heaven, all right? But heaven won't be as much as heaven as it could be if I'd really been faithful to God of serving the Lord. And this is, this again, this is, this is where that element of the courage is involved. The second guy that's mentioned in this regard is Eliezer, all right? And in verses 12 and 14, it talks about how he and David were in this barley field and the Philistine army was coming and all the people around them, all right, the citizens, civilians, and some of the soldiers, they all took flight. This is hopeless. We're out of here. But not David and not Eliezer. They stood in this field and they said, hey, this property doesn't belong to the Philistines. This is God's turf. We're not giving it up. And they went to battle, and they stood in that field until the battle was completely over. This is referenced again in 2 Samuel. Let me read this, this chapter 23, verse 10. It says, They arose, and they smote the, smote the Philistines. Eliezer did it until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day. In other words, he kept moving and working and swinging that sword and fighting in the battle. And it says his hand clave. Clave. Now, have you ever worked with a tool so long that your, your hand just cramps around it? When we were kids, we used to do that thing where we'd grab our fingers as tight as we could and hold as long as we could until it just kind of cramped. Now, I know some of you weren't weird child like I was, but anyway, you'll figure it out later. But if you've ever done it, your, your hand just kind of, this is exactly, his hand was frozen to his sword. So uh, we, have, we have a sword as well. We need to get a grip on the Word of God in our life. Because although we're not fighting Philistines, we're still in a spiritual battle. If your spiritual eyes could be opened at this moment, it would probably shock you to see what was going on. Now, we can see, taste, feel the physical world around us, but we're not so cognizant of what's going on in the spiritual realm most of the time. But in the spiritual realm, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, myriads of angels. There's the devil and all his demons, probably hundreds of millions of them as well. Now, of course, we got him out number two to one in the angel category, all right? So we got him out manned, out class. We're in good shape. But all that, there's a battle that's happening. You know, there, there are demons that seek to, to minister to us, to, to implant thoughts in our mind, to lead us astray, to tempt us in different ways. Some of that's your flesh, some of it's the world, and some of it's the devil. 
But boy, what a shock that would probably be if we could just see for a moment. You know, it's like Elijah at Dothan when they were surrounded and the, and the servant said, oh man, we're doomed. And the Lord said, open his eyes. And when the Lord opened the servant's eyes, he said, oh, no sweat. <laughs> they that be for us are more than they be against us. We got this. Maybe that's you should kind of take that position today. No sweat. We got this. He said, but you don't know what I'm dealing with. Maybe you don't know who's on your side. Maybe you don't know what you have in regard to God's word and his power and his presence. These guys did. They stood, all right? And God delivered them. Yeah, there was, there was work. There was labor. There was sweat. There was blood. There was sacrifice. There was commitment. There were tears. God delivered them. He didn't do it with a lightning bolt. A big monster and bear didn't come out of the wood and devour the Philistines, all right? He just did it with faithful men. Faithful people said, if it takes courage, I'm here. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. The third that's mentioned is Eliezer, as we said. Uh, well, you, I mean, the third one is, is Zelak and Emna. Let me get, I think, oh, there it is. And these are some interesting names as well, Ithma. Now, these guys weren't even Jewish guys. They, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't homelanders, all right? These were outlanders. These were Gentiles, all right? But they saw what God was doing in David and with David and said, we want to be a part of that. Now, the Bible says that the gospel comes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'll praise God for that. Amen. We, we are not part of the original vine, but we have been engrafted in. So we're part of the kingdom of God as a Gentile I am, all right? But here's the thing about it. I am part of what God is doing. I'm in God's family. I should pay homage to my king, the Lord Jesus Christ. I should glorify him as my Lord and my Savior. But I also should stand in the place of courage and do whatever exploit God has for me. It's easy to stand around and complain about how bad things are. And we can all do that, and I can be the chief at that sometimes. Because things do look desperate. and This is a dark time for, for the world and for our nation and for, for families and homes. But what we need, and especially in regard to, to fathers today, is we need men who will step up and take courage. Men who say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the Lord. I'm not ashamed of his word, and I'm not ashamed to be called a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because the only thing that is going to turn back the tide of this godlessness and this prayerlessness is coming to people and say, hey, I will be a man of courage. I will begin to seek God's face. I will begin to believe God's word. I'll begin to swing my sword. I'll begin to trust the Lord because this prayerlessness and this actionlessness and this sacrifice Official life that's not being lived has brought about prayerless lives, prayerless churches, families breaking up, homes being destroyed, and the youth of our culture being destroyed. What's going to take to turn back the tide? The same simple element of just being courageous, you know. But there's, there just seems to be a lack of that in the culture today. We have, we have more cowardly than we do courageous in the context of men of God. Can I get a witness on that? I'm serious. There seems to be more cowards in the kingdom than there are courageous in the kingdom. And somebody needs to come up, grab us by the nap of our neck, give us a good shake and say, you're a man of God, act like it. <laughs> be what you are. Quit trying to be something you're not. You're never going to be happy. And you're never going to be happy until you say, hey, I'm going to be what God's called me to be. That's courage. But with that courage is this element of commitment. And it mentions several guys in, in this element of commitment. Obviously, Commitment is, is part of this same byproduct of, of living this life of, of surrender, being courageous for Christ. Amasai is mentioned. And literally, his name means to carry a burden. And it says that Amasai was with David at Ziklag. Now, if y'all don't remember Ziklag, it, it was a, a bad place because David had taken his mighty men and his troop of about 300, and they had left Israel. David's in depression about this point in his life, all right? He's in despair. He's saying, what's the use? I'm just going to go to Ziklag. Ziklag's not Israel. Ziklag is, is, is in a pagan land. Ziklag is with pagan people. Ziklag's with pagan kings. He said, I'm just going to go stand with those guys. And there's a lot of, a lot of guys who've done that. What's the use? Well, I'm not, it's not working. I'm not doing, and they just kind of forsake where they should be. So he goes to Ziklag thinking they're going to like him. And he goes up and meets the king of Ziklag and says to him, <clears throat> I'm going to stand with you and fight with you. Here's my forces, my men. And so Ziklag takes a liking to him. He says, okay, well, the king says, well, you can fight with us. He said, in fact, we're going to go to battle against the, uh, Saul here pretty soon. You want to join us? Yeah. <laughs> so he goes down there to all the kings of the Philistines, and the Ziklag comes in and says, hey, I got somebody I want to introduce you to. Well, they knew who he was. 
<laughs> That's David. And all of them say, no way. No way. And it's interesting, by the way, anytime you try to forsake the Lord and think you're going to have real fellowship and acceptance and love from the world, it ain't going to happen. Those old friends are going to disappoint you every time. Those old relationships are going to leave you high and dry and stranded and empty and miserable. And so they reject him. Meanwhile, while David and his men are with the king at Ziklag meeting the Philistine kings, another group comes up from the south and raids his camp, takes away all his goods and his women, and flees. And the Lord gives David later a great promise to go restore what he's lost, and David comes back to the Lord and begins to follow the Lord again, restores what's been lost, but it's, it's a bad day at Ziklag. All right? And Amasai's been with David in his ups, and he's been with David in his downs, and I love his name because it means he carries the burden. He's willing to carry. In other words, he realizes ain't nobody perfect but Jesus, all right? Ain't nobody perfect. David stumbled. I'm, I'm still in. I'm faithful. You can count on me. In fact, it talks about it in, in, in chapter 12. We read for 11. It says that in another place, this spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captain. He says, thine are we, David. We are on your side, son of Jesse. Peace, peace be unto you. Peace be to your helpers, for God helps you. And then David received them and made them captains of the band. David found these guys to be faithful no matter what. That's commitment. That's, that's what real commitment is. So many times, I, we have this kind of fair weather commitment. As long as everything's good, I'll be committed to you. But when things go bad, hey, I, I, I ain't got time for you. That's not the kind of commitment that Amasai had. Another guy that's mentioned here is, is, uh, is uh, Benaniah, and he, he's also a man of commitment. His, his name literally means that Jehovah has built up. That's a good name to have, amen? That my strength is from Jehovah, my power, my victory. Verses 22 and 25, if you're open in 1 Chronicles there, chapter 11. Ben and I, the son of Jehadiah, the son of a valiant man, Kabzil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. That's notable, why? Because these are big guys. And not only are they big guys, they're like lions, all right? But then it says he went down and he slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. That's not going to fit most of the men in our churches these days. You may be willing to go slay a lion, but if he's in the pit, you go in. I'm not getting in the pit. That's close quarters. You don't do close quarters with lions, right? That's your Daniel, perhaps. <laughs> it's a, and especially, you know he's not a Baptist because it's on a snowy day. <laughs> He's not going to be anywhere to help out on a snowy day. But he slew the lion in the pit. I don't know why it gives us that description, but I think it's awesome. It just shows you the level of his commitment, obviously. To whatever it takes to get the job done, count on me. I'm there, and I'm not just talking there. I'm really there. It goes on, he slew an Egyptian man of great stature, five cubits high. I mean, that's around eight feet tall. And the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. He went down to him with a staff. Oh, so he takes a staff down there against this giant of a man, and he plucks the spear out of the Egyptian's hand. And then he slew him with his own spear. <laughs> These things did Ben and I, the son of Joida, and he had that name among the, the three mighties. He had a name among the three mighties. These are the top three guys, and of the top three, is, uh, here's just Joadiah, apparently, because he was an honorable, it says. He was honorable among them. He was a man, recognized as a man of integrity. He's, a, he's not just another Joe, so to say, all right? He's not just a, another guy in the crowd. He's not just another mighty man, even. He excels a little bit beyond that. He was more honorable than the 30, it goes on to say. Wow. Wow. What was so honorable about him? Well, yeah, he's probably the best looking guy. And his testosterone levels were higher. He probably had a degree, maybe a PhD. Came from good background, had money, good genes. No, none of that. He was a man of commitment, extreme commitment. That's what made him honorable. There's a lot of people who seek honor. In fact, that's probably what most people in the world seek. And by I say that, uh, what are most people? They want to be recognized. They want to be respected. They want honor, all right? The Bible tells us as Christians, we're to honor all men, especially the brotherhood, all right? But people seek for honor. But you don't get honor, real honor, that integrity kind of honor, 
by being cowardly. You don't get that kind of honor by, by sitting on the side. You don't get that kind of honor from, by being even a cheerleader. There's a lot of cheerleaders for, for those who are actually on the field. You get that kind of, kind of honor from getting out on the field and doing what God's called you to do, standing in the barley field by yourself or with David and holding your sword no matter what it is and just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Honor comes as, in a Christian's life as a result of, I think, just being obedient and as, a, as the flow out of the obedience to Christ become, these exploits come. You don't have to go looking for an exploit as we talk about these, this word and how it was used. It just comes from doing what was, what's in front of you. I mean, what's in front of you right now? Just do what you know is the right thing to do. Whether it's this Egyptian giant or whatever it may be. I mean, all that represents Satan and his threats, obviously. But we're greater than that. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. A third guy mentioned in this element of, of com commitment is Joab. And he takes the city of Jabuth. All right. Now, there's that passage in 2 Samuel mentioned there. It talks about how that, that uh, Jabu was so fortified and impenetrable by enemies that even the blind and the lame could protect Jabu. Now, Jabu, if you look at the, on, on, in geography at the time of David, uh, remember David uh, makes the city of Jerusalem his home. But Jabu was Jabu, which is the larger, higher parts of Jerusalem in ancient times. And right below was another part of the city called Salem. And it was Jabu Salem, which later became Jerusalem, all right, which became the throne. All right, so we have to take this place, though, this high fortified place. And nobody can take it. It is so fortified that blind people can defend it, lame people can defend it, weak people can defend it. It's, it's impenetrable. But Jabu says, I'll do it. I'll go. I'll take it. You know, who's, who's going to lead this charge? Not me. You know, let Terry go. <laughs> let Gary go. Send somebody else. I picture Isaiah when he's in there and he's had that encounter with God. And he says, Lord says, whom shall I send? And he says, send me, Lord. The thing about these six guys, five, six guys we've already mentioned, you know, that they're all, they're all part, they all have a vision for this kingdom. And that's what it takes in a church. That's what it takes in, in, in a family. It's what it takes in your own personal life to have vision and say, I'm on that team. I'm part of that group. I'm going to, be, I'm going to participate there because that's, they're doing something for the glory of God. I want to be a part of that. The, th the third element here is this element of compassion. Now, I mentioned this story at the beginning. We read, as she read that passage about how there, David was saying, oh, that I could have a drink from the well at Bethlehem. Remember that? And he said, I just want a drink of that water. Have you ever been that kind of, in that kind of place? Uh, uh, I travel a lot in ministry over the years. There's lots of places I've been that uh, didn't, you know, you just think, you think about it at home, I could have something. Like, I'm a, I'm a pepper, all right? I don't like Coca-Cola. I don't like Pepsi-Cola. I don't like, you know, all that other energy drinks and all that stuff. But I do like a Dr. Pepper. I'll just be honest. I love Dr. Pepper. You know, I'm a 10 2 4 guy. And maybe I'm between. But I've, I've got it down to about one a day at most now, okay? Because I'm, I'm, it was getting the best of me. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching that. But I can't tell you how many times I've been to some foreign land somewhere, whether in Eastern Europe or even in, in Israel or down in in Caribbean or Mexico somewhere and thought, oh man, a Dr. Pepper would be good right now. But there ain't no Dr. Peppers. They don't have that global coverage like Coca-Cola. It kind of owns the world, you know. But I, I think, oh, I Dr. Pepper. So you want to get your, I don't want a Coke, I want Dr. Pepper. I remember one time in Israel, I, I, we were at the airport and I was helping this guy with a suitcase. Man, your suitcases are heavy. He says, hey, they're full of tracks for the Muslims. I said, well, God bless you. He was going to Israel with us, you know, carrying gospel trucks for the Muslims. I said, that's noble. So when, when we're on the trip to Israel, and I, I walk back in the back of the bus, and he's drinking a Dr. Pepper. I said, where'd you get a Dr. Pepper? He said, those really weren't tracks for the Muslims. <laughs> he said, I had a case of Dr. Pepper in there. <laughs> and I did get him, give me one, all right. But I kind of think that same context that here's David. Say, oh, man, man, when... Just a drink from that Bethlehem well. All right? And these guys, you can see these three guys, they get together and say, let's go get him some water from Bethlehem. Right, that's, that's love, is it not? That's genuine compassion. Excuse me, you're going to do what? There's a garrison of the Philistines, all right? They're there in Bethlehem. How do you think you're going to get through? Don't worry, baby. We're going to, we, you know, we're the, we're, we're the mighties. <laughs> you know, we're, we're the men of, we're, we're David's mighty men. We got this. 
and it doesn't tell you how they do it. It says they go in, they get the water, they bring it back to David, offer him this probably this wineskin that's full of water, and said, this is water from the well in Bethlehem. And David is so freaked out by it and shocked by it. He says, I cannot drink this. It was such a, 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 a display of sacrifice of commitment, of courage, these things we just mentioned, all just in the, it, I mean, he, I, I can just see him looking at him saying, you guys risk your life for this. I'm not, I'm not good enough for this. I'm not, but I know who is. Let's offer it to the Lord. Now, maybe you're thinking these guys are going to be really ticked off because he pours the water out like that. No, they understood because they understood David's integrity came from the Lord. They understand David's might and his battle, because all they're doing is just, they're just following a man who's, who's exemplifying himself. And he pours it out before the Lord. And it's a sacrifice to the Lord to honor them and to honor the Lord in it. You know, I look at stories like that, and I, 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 I don't know, maybe you're, hopefully you're like this yourself, and you just say, you know, wow, that's, that's amazing. What have I done for my king? It required that kind of sacrifice. And that kind of commitment. And that kind of love. And we can sit around and say, I love you, Lord, but man, to demonstrate that. that I love God. I'm willing. Now, there's a lot of other symbolism in this story. I mean, who was born in Bethlehem? Jesus, all right? And who is declared to be himself the water of life? So there's a lot of things we could look at spiritually and typically and symbolically here. But I want you to see more than anything else that this is a story of deep, deep compassion. And what really propels people to do things for the glory of God ultimately has to come from that heart of deep compassion. But where does this compassion come from? And where does this courage come from? And where does this commitment come from? I think it comes from deep convictions. True courage True commitment, true compassion flows from a conviction. What's, what is my conviction? I believe that the word of God is true. I believe Jesus is the king. I believe that every knee will bow before him one day and confess that he's the Lord. And if I really, really, truly, honestly believe that, then those convictions will determine the course of my life. If I don't really believe it, fully, completely, it's not going to have a whole lot of effect on my life. It may get me down to the church house and put some money in the plate, but where is it in the rest of my life where these exploits and this valor and this courage, courage I truly believe is born of convictions. And what stops us from doing these exploits of reaching and caring and you know, picking up that phone and calling that person we know is suffering or knocking on the door of that friend we know is, is struggling or, or reaching out to that married couple we, we know we're friends with, we know their life is, is in struggle and their marriage is hurt. What keeps people from taking that step to, or, or sitting there and saying, well, I hope the preacher goes and sees them. But no, what propels you to do some exploit? Some, some element, something that might require sacrifice of what people think about you or how they might see you from now on or might think about you to just go do, just go be what God's called you to be. If we're going to extend, extend the kingdom of God as we've been called to do, then these are the elements that will be required for us if we're, if we're going to really be serious about it. If we're really going to come and, and not just be stirred up and say, oh, yeah, count me in, buddy. But really go do it. It's going to come from this heart of saying, I truly believe. And that's what? Faith, is it not? I truly believe. Faith without works is just dead. Faith with works, well, it's it's what true faith really is. And, And I know, folks, it's easy to see everything that's wrong around us. But it's another thing to stand up and say, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to say something. I'm going to pray. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to commit, you know. And here's the beauty of it. In all these stories, it took a miracle. These guys didn't have this supernatural strength in and of themselves. God showed up. God gave them passage to that well. God gave them strength to fight that line. God gave them the the power and the courage to face the, the giants they had to face and to deal with the problems they had to face. They just did it, though. 
And it comes from a, a loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all on the same team. We're all part of extending the kingdom. We all need to be this, the, these kind of people, you know, that, that out of our convictions flow compassion, and out of that compassion comes courage, and, and courage and commitment flow from those things. But it all gets down to this, that we're all standing on the solid rock. We're all, we're all part of God's kingdom, and we should be doing what God's called us to do to be part of that kingdom. There are those of you in this room who have proven yourselves to be people that fall into this category, I really believe, of what I call David's mighty men. There are some who like to think they are but aren't. And those who are don't even think they are. <laughs> but there's room for everybody there. And I'm just glad to be part of a fellowship of people men and women and young people who believe that the kingdom of God is coming in its fullness one day, but we're still part of the building process today. And we still have a king that we can be loyal to, and that we can be, have convictions about, and it will manifest in our hearts and lives by saying, hey, I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to speak when God tells me to speak. I'll give when God tells me to give. I'll surrender. I'll sacrifice whatever the Lord wants, whatever the king wants, because that's what my desire is. I, I'm not real familiar with this, the, the background of this particular verse in Psalms 12. But then in Psalms 12, 1, there's this verse, and I've got it in two different translations. I don't know where David's head and heart is, but he says, Lord, help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from the sons of men. You like that NIV translation where it says, help, Lord, for no one's faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Now, I, pro I have found myself probably in that place before. Well, Lord... God, where are those who really want to do something for your glory? They're, they fell from the face of the earth. I think Elijah felt that one time. God said, oh, I'm not through, Elijah. Get yourself back out of this cave. I have hundreds of others who have not fallen under Jezebel's threats. Don't give up. But leave that to me. <laughs> leave the rest of it to me. Uh, when, I, when I read these passages and study these passages of scriptures, I hope that it does for you what it do, does in me. It stirs me. Say, I want to be that kind of guy. I want to be that man. You, you say, I, I want to be that person in God's kingdom that's, that fits that bill. That when it comes time, you know, to, for those who, who stand, who've been faithful to their king, that I won't ask to be remain seated. Amen. So I think this is a good challenging verse. It's obviously, it's very convicting to me. I hope it is as well as you. But more than convicting, I hope that it challenges you and encourages you to say, let's just rise. Let's, let's rise to the ranks. And if I've taken a, a spiritual vacation, at, then I'm back in, Lord. Here, count on me. I'm in. I'm going to be faithful. Maybe I've fallen into that kind of despair that David's talking about. There's really nobody left, but there are. They're still the faithful. They're not as many as they used to be, but they're still there. Let's join ranks with God's faithful and be what God's called us to be. I really believe with all my heart that God lets us know that that really does, and I'm not excluding anybody, but I really do believe the first step should be taken by men. And that's why I think on days like today when we recognize fathers especially, that we encourage you, you know, to be all God's called you to be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something. I'm not going to give an invitation so the band can stay seated as well. But if you're a dad here today, I want you just to stand right now just for a moment because I want to pray for you and for me and for us today. So every dad, granddad in here, just take a moment to stand with me and bow your heads. And I'm going to ask those around these dads just to, to be praying for them. Father, when we take a look in your word and you tell us it's like a mirror and we could certainly see ourselves. But Father, I, I know that no matter where I am as I look in that mirror, I know I need more of you in my life. And that that comes by giving more of myself to you. So Father, as you look in the hearts of these men in this room, including me, God, I pray you'd wash us, cleanse us, prepare us, fill us. Lord, this is a dark day. And the last thing we need to be doing at this time and season in history and in this world is to be backing up. 
living in despair, defeat or frustration. God, that we would let our hands cleave to the sword of your word with a determined spirit that says, Lord, count me in. I want to be the faithful. I do believe. I do believe. I believe you. I believe your word. I believe your message. I believe the gospel. So, Father, fill these men in this room with your power, with your glory, with your strength, with your assurance. And as they lay down everything before you, God, let them experience, Lord, an understanding that your blood washes everything and forgives everything. Because, Lord, we have failed on so many fronts. But you love us. You forgive us. How could we say no to that? Count me in. Count us in, Lord. And bless these men with a special and unique anointing in their life to continue to walk forward in the kingdom with you. Strengthen us by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 You can be seated. Give another round of applause for our dads. Amen. amen. I appreciate you being here. That's a, that's a great symbol and a great testimony of, of you, Dad, and for you, Dad, and I appreciate that, and I thank God for that. God bless you, and may God increase your tribe. Amen. Brother Gary, Brother Matt's going to share a testimony about camp first. Brother Gary's coming. All right. Well, we just got back last week from Alto Frio out in the Texas Hill Country, and I know you guys were praying for us because we made it back after 103 degrees every day at camp it was hot but the river kept us cool which was which was really nice uh, but I, I do want to take a moment and thank you guys for your prayer support you know because of your prayer support we had teenagers who were opening up about some real personal stuff some some deep stuff and because of that they they're able to start the healing process and seeking jesus on that but i also want to thank you guys for your financial support you know we had 15 teenagers who went and um that's, that's 15 sets of parents that didn't have to, to sweat sending their, their kids to camp. So thank you so much. So I've been told that today is Father's Day. And so dads, as on your way out, we have a special gift for you. Don't forget to pick those up on your way out today. And tonight, since it is Father's Day, we do not have evening services. Yes, we're, we're taking a summer break for Lyft, but we still have children's and youth services Sunday nights. Not tonight, because it's Father's Day. You're welcome, dads. On Wednesday nights, we're having a men's Bible study and a women's Bible study. And if you have not made it, if you were here last Wednesday, y'all need to be here because it's a good time. Like, guys, y'all really need to be here for that. Ladies, y'all really need to be here for that. We need that midweek pickup. So don't miss those Wednesday night Bible studies. Also, our marriage conference coming up, it's entitled Love Matters. Save the date, guys. It's spring campus is September 23rd through the 24th. And at our Magnolia campus, it's the 30th through the 1st. So save that date and, and start looking forward to that marriage conference coming up. You guys can stay connected to us. If you're watching on, on Facebook, you know how to stay connected to us through Facebook. We also have a YouTube page and our bfchurch.com page. For our guests who are watching online, if you would, click that link below where it says bfchurch.com and go to the guest tab so you can fill out a little bit of information if you have any prayer requests so we can get to know you a little bit more and, and know what your needs are and we can reach out to you. If you're a guest here today, I know you were asked to fill out that welcome card that's in the seat right in front of you. And then we have a gift for you. So if you're a guy here today, a dad here today that's also a guest, you get two gifts. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. You know, our church has been able to do so much because we have listened to God and we've, we've done as he's asked. We've given as he's asked. We have three ways that you can give. You can give while you're here today through our offering receptacles. You can give online at bfchurch.com. You can also drop it off during the week. We're here Monday through Thursday. So before we leave, before I dismiss uh, our kids camp, we leave this coming Saturday. We're going back to the hill country. I didn't learn my lesson the first time. I just want to lift that group up to you today because we have 22 kids going. We have seven, eight adults going. Uh, but I just want to take a moment and, and you guys be in prayer with me as we, we lift them up. And again, for those who have supported us through prayer, supported us through financial support to get those kids there, that's 22 kids whose lives are going to be impacted. 
So let, let's pray for them. Father God, I thank you. Father, for the group that you've led towards us, God, I pray for travel mercies as we get there. God, I pray for, God, for our health as we're there. God, that the heat doesn't overcome us. God, that hearts would be open to receive your word. God, that our leaders would have strength. God, thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for those here today that have supported us financially. God, because of them, we're able to take this many kids and impact this many lives. So God, bless, I ask that you bless this time, bless this, this trip that we have. God, in Jesus' name, amen. As you are dismissed, uh, for those that are going to be helping out with VBS, we are having our VBS meeting, very brief meeting in the fellowship hall. You are dismissed.